All right, <laughs> point one, species and populations. Um, so some uh, terminology here, species, group of organisms that can interbreed um, to produce fertile offspring. A population is a group of the same species living together um, in a habitat, which is the environment where they live. And then their ecological niche is basically the role they play in the environment, um, where, when, how they're living, what they're doing, um, what they're eating, when they're active, etc. cetera. Um, populations will change and respond to the environment. Uh, so this is a really interesting case study uh, where you see um, species of salamanders. And you might actually notice here that it's Encetina eschislotzi picta, and then the EE -E is going to be the same in each one. Um, these are all actually different subspecies of the same species of salamander. Um, so as you move um, around, these are mountain ranges in California. They only live at a, a high elevation. And uh, as you go um, between each species, they actually can interbreed. Um, and then once you get to the extreme ends, these two are so different that they actually do not interbreed anymore. Um, so kind of an interesting case study on, on like what species really looks like in the natural world. It's kind of a lot more confusing um, than the neat little boxes we try to put around things. Um, whereas, you know, going this way directly next to each other, they all can interbreed, produce viable offspring. But once you get to the extremes, they can't anymore. Um, kind of a cool like spatial representation of, of sort of how it happens um, through time, right? So maybe um, this could be the common ancestor of two different species, and then they just kind of slowly diverge. And then if they have the chance of not really meeting each other again and spreading information, they might actually become two different species. Um, there's actually a similar um, example of this with some gulls um, that live in the Arctic. Um, so they live around the, the whole pole um, and populations can interbreed until you get to the spot where they meet and then one version is a lot darker than the other version and they actually don't interbreed. Kind of interesting. Um, any system has a carrying capacity. This is basically the maximum population um, that an ecosystem could have. And that's based on, you know, the amount of food available, the amount of habitat available, um, perhaps the length of the seasons, right? That could definitely affect the carrying capacity of an ecosystem. Uh, and of course, you know, things like human impacts um, and then we can see here how the carrying capacity might change through the winter. Um, so of course in the winter there's a lot less food so generally the carrying capacity is going to be much lower. Um, and then as spring comes around things start to bloom, um, there's more food sources available, that's why everyone starts to breed because carrying capacity has increased. Um, whoops, sorry about that. Let's fix this. Okay, apologies. Um, yeah, so Carrying capacity will change based on the amount of resources available. Um, and then as those resources change, you might lead to starvation. You might get more you know, other effects that would change the uh, actual numbers of species or individuals. Um, so once again, the species will share common characteristics and most importantly, they uh, interbreed to produce fertile offspring. Um, so these uh, little guys, uh, even though they're, you know, actually living, um, they can't produce other offspring. So a mule is sterile as well as a liger. Um, so they're not gonna continue to breed, it's kind of a dead end. A habitat is just the environment where they live. And a niche is uh, gonna be the, basically how they're making their living. Um, so a really cool example here of different species of warbler that actually, they all eat the same food, but they forage in different areas of the tree. Um, and so this is sort of niche partitioning. Um, if they all foraged on the top of the tree, then you would have five different species all trying to get to the same place. Um, and so um, partitioning out the different spots of the tree helps them not compete so much. Um, and you can see similar examples uh, in the savanna. We looked at an example of this where um, certain animals will start by eating the first, um, the first grasses and then the wildebeest will move in second and then the gazelles will eat the sprouts that have come off of the other browse. Um, again, you're kind of going for different food sources because if you all went for the same one, then you'd be directly competing, right? Then zebras and wildebeest and gazelles would all be fighting for the same tall grass. Whereas if you take a, pick a different one, you can actually not have to, to compete so much. Um, and so that's really the difference between the fundamental niche, all the available food versus the realized niche, the food you actually eat. 
Um, so possibly, you know, possibly these ungulates, these herbivores could eat all the types of grasses. Um, they, their um, real, uh, fundamental niche would be all of the foods, but their realized niche is just the foods that they do eat. Um, so the example here um, with these barnacles, um, they could potentially live in the entire range, right? Um, so the blue one here, we see its fundamental niche could be right here. And then the realized niche is the same. Um, the smaller species actually could live in the whole range, um, but they only have a smaller realized niche because they can't compete as well with the, the um, Balanus species. Um, so their realized niche is a lot smaller just based on competition and biotic interactions. Probably the same thing here, right? If you're a small little gazelle, probably you'll, it'd be harder for you to compete with these larger ungulates. So then you're kind of going for maybe a more marginal food source or maybe a smaller realized niche than the, the full potential niche you could take. Uh, there's also abiotic factors. These are the non-living physical factors of the environment, things like temperature and sunlight and pH and salinity, how salty something is, um, precipitation, etc. cetera. Um, this is, a lot of this is like nutrient cycles. Um, so things like nitrogen, um, carbon dioxide, of course, cycles through systems. Um, phosphorus, other, other vital nutrients will, will kind of go in through plants and then cycle through um, other abiotic aspects of the environment. Um, here's some interactions. We have, of course, hunting, predation, herbivory, herbivores eat plants. Parasites is when uh, one species will kind of take energy from another, but without necessarily killing the species, but definitely harming it. Um, and all of these interactions will affect the carrying capacity. So these are, these are going to be what causes the um, population of organisms to decrease a lot of these uh, interactions. Um, and they're going to kind of fluctuate over time. So we see lots of up and down here, which is representing negative feedback loops. Um, so again, as we saw with the um, negative feedback or the feedback loop, slideshow, um, the populations sort of respond to each other. So when there's a spike in hairs, you can see a spike in um, links directly after it. And then vice versa, a drop in hairs will lead to a drop in links the next years. Um, but there is a time lag, right? Because um, in the one year where there's a boom of rabbits, that'll be a, a good time for the links to feast. So the next year they might have a surplus of babies. Um, and then here's some examples of populations, same species, same area, same time. Um, so we studied the population of same mule deer at VBS. <clears throat> um, and then different species will have different uh, growth rates of their population based on how they reproduce um, as well as other factors too. Um, so those are selected species, the rapid reproducers will tend to explode in population um, and maybe they go right past the carrying capacity and then they'll see a big drop um, as well. Um, so kind of really dramatic changes in population um, versus the K-selected species. Uh, in K-selected, K stands for carrying capacity um, because those animals like uh, large carnivores and humans, we tend to slow down our reproduction to actually meet carrying capacity, which you actually can sort of see in human societies too, if you think about it. Um, 100 years ago, people would have many, many children, you know, eight, 10 kids, whereas now people are having only about two kids or so. Um, we're actually slowing down our reproduction to kind of meet that carrying capacity. Um, so the names here are just based on the shape, right? This kind of looks like an S, a little bit stretched out. And then this looks like a J. The J is going to be that really fast spiking growth of those rapid reproducers, the boom and bust species like insects. Um, limiting factors are going to be the big thing that's going to limit the population, right? That's where that comes from, limiting, because it slows population growth um, until it gets to carrying capacity. Um, so all of these things actually would be limiting factors. Um, the weather is going to limit how much population you can have. The amount of predators will affect your population. The amount of food available, um, the amount of water available, etc. <clears throat> Um, so examples of IB style questions, interpret, interpret graphical representations. Um, so what do you see here? How are the links responding to the hairs and vice versa? 
Um, you can kind of see too, right? The hares have way more dramatic changes in population um, because they're more of an R selected species um, than the lynx, which tend to have fewer uh, offspring in general. Um, so in this kind of case, you might actually be given numbers and values to, to interpret. And once again, you can find links to this slideshow in the description.